So we're in Burslem, one of the six towns of the Potteries in Stoke-on-Trent. This art school used to supply talent to the ceramics industry that once thrived here. The building was renovated and it reopened in 1999. This is the Atrium Gallery, a lovely space and I'm fortunate in being able to use it to show you some of my paintings and drawings and prints. 14 of the 18 images are made from the human figure, mostly in watercolour, gouache, ink, chalk, pencil or biro. This one, like many, is made in gouache over pencil and watercolour in one rapid hit. To me, art should be about taking risks and these drawings were chosen because I believe that in them something works by accident that I couldn't repeat. This might simply have resulted from risking an unfamiliar palette against an as yet untried background colour, as in this one. Often though, the edginess results naturally from having to work fast from a model. Sooner or later the model's going to move, so there's always a kind of attendant urgency about the activity. On the other hand, there's also this voice saying, slow down, this is about life itself, it's about a person with an inner world, and it's about your own life too mate, about your own mortality. I chose this one because I like the kind of doppelganger effect with one figure emerging out of the other. Someone pointed out the lack of male figures in the exhibition. I do draw from male models too, it's just that they make up a much smaller proportion and only one made it through. Life drawing is enjoying a bit of a comeback, if only because of its relevance to character animation in movies and games and to fashion illustration, but I believe there is still a place for life drawing in fine art itself. I'm sure the way to get there is not by making carefully controlled, technically showy drawings. It has to do with letting the drawing somehow transcend what's in front of you. I think it's about encouraging weird things to happen visually, letting the image and materials talk back. In this next one, I've used a little Dutch metal, that's like fake gold leaf. I have this theory that no matter what gender, age, shape, size the model might be, that they're standing in for us. In other words, when we're drawing from life, we're drawing ourselves. That's the way to empathise with the subject. I think it's also the secret to making life drawing relevant to the human condition, and so to contemporary art. Here's another experiment, again using gold leaf and a technique known as monoprinting on. In this case, text from A Midsummer Night's Dream. I got to thinking, why, like real people, shouldn't fairies come in all shapes and sizes? I quite like to use some exaggeration in my drawings, perhaps of a hand or a foot sticking out towards us. I've played the same game in the next drawing, really laying on the perspective of the hand in the foreground and then trying to justify it in the rest of the drawing. The arrangement had a classical feel as though modern day figures had been transported into an Etruscan landscape or something. To me, the human figure is relevant to con contemporary art if only in so much as we are of that species. Our whole understanding of the world and sensations of it are bound up, necessarily, with our scale and sensory apparatus. There must be a way of making life drawing relevant. It's just up to us to find it.
The last few images are given over to the ongoing theme of life through the screens of movies, TVs, computers and video games, explained more fully at an exhibition at the Lyceum Theatre Crew in 2010, which you can also find on YouTube. Of course, it's not the pictures that are important, but the people in them and the act of making them. Take the people out of art and crafts and all you're left with is stuff, materialism. The final part of this little ex exhibition is given over to a cabinet dedicated to the memory of my father, the late Joseph Ferenczi. It contains models and a few of the drawings he made for animal designs while employed as a modeller at the studio Silo Pottery in Burslem during the late 1950s and early 60s. Apart from the foal, which he told me about, I'm not sure which of the other models he made, though I have a good idea from their appearance. The foal, he told me, was particularly tricky on account of the wetness of the clay, its legs buckling even as he worked. But the material was at the same time sympathetic in conveying a newborn animal, barely able to support its own weight. An interview with the studio's Hungarian owner, Joseph Seiler, was published in an issue of the Pottery Gazette and Glass Trade Review of 1957. It was a tough story and it tells how Seiler took evening classes here at Burslem School of Art in order to further the pottery's success. The works was taken over by Moreland Pottery in 1985. Today very little of the pottery's industry remains just a handful of crumbling bottle kilns providing a clue to what once was. Oh, and of course, the amazing facade of the building opposite this school of art, the Wedgwood Institute. There's still a tremendous amount of creative talent about these parts, and no doubt the focus survives. You can't help but wonder just what the future holds.